Testing. Peace and blessings. Hi, my friends in the front of the stage. Are you here for Empowering Voices, the role of DEI and revolutionizing animal advocacy? If so, if you can please have a seat, we appreciate it. Otherwise, you can continue your conversations right outside the door. Thank you. <laughs> Teamwork makes the dream work. Okay. Yes. No, no, no. We're talking about if you're here for this session, then thank you. We appreciate you. Part two from this morning. <laughs> okay. All right. I'm going to, okay, we're going to get started. I'm going to briefly introduce myself and you can introduce yourself and what you talk about and then I'll, okay. All right, uh, show of hands, who is at this morning's session? Okay, great, okay, awesome. Um, I'm Nadja Wright Brown. I am the co-founder and executive director of Black Veg Society and also uh, co-owner of the Land of Kush Vegan Soap Bistro in Baltimore. The discussion that I'm gonna have today is about learning to grow personally and professionally with diversity, equity, and inclusion. Hello, <laughs> I'm Dr. Nelva Lee. I am the president and founder of the Medical Interpreting and Translating Institute. Um, and basically what we do at Mitio is we provide training for anyone that's bilingual to become interpreters and translators. And we also provide consulting to, in, to corporations on how to better engage with their diverse workforce. And so I will be talking to you guys today. Anyone that's a manager, anyone that's a company owner that wants to better engage with their diverse workforce. That's, that's the main thrust of my presentation today. Thank you, Nelva Lee. So when I got invited to talk about this uh, topic, I wasn't sure what I was going to say, but um, thinking about how you grow personally and professionally in DEI, it's important and it can't be overlooked in any organization because uh, sorry to say, DEI starts with you. And you, 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 all of you. So it's not on just the organization or the company, it's you. Um, it's not a program, it's self-awareness. How self-aware are you in the actions that you are taking to diversify, be equitable, equitable and include different voices, diverse voices, people, and all sorts in um, your, your life and your company. Inclusive leadership. Are you, are you inclusive as a leader? Are you leading by example? Uh, and incorporating DEI, and you do not have to have a title to be a leader. There is a book out there about it called "You Don't Have to Be a uh, You Don't Have to Have a Title to Be a Leader." So everybody in this room can be a leader, title or not. So again, it starts with you. Um, it's very important to have this diversity and equity, equity, uh, equity and inclusion in your corporation because one, innovation and creativity, like how diverse, how innovative and creative can you be when everyone is sharing the same voice? Okay, by show, show of hands, can, can you really do that? If it's just you having the same voice, what type of innovation are you gonna have when everyone has the same idea? So that's one of the reasons why it's important. Um, decision making, when you have diverse individuals with di different background and perspectives that collaborate, there's a variety of insights and knowledge to the process. This diversity of perspectives helps in making more informed and well-rounded decisions. And I think the AVA Summit has done a great job in being inclusive uh, and as diverse as they can possibly be in this summit, okay? So give it up to them. It's Africa, Asia, Latin America. You know, some, someone asked me uh, a little while ago after a session, um, hey, you know, what's, where, where are all the black people? I can't speak for the black people. I know Apex was here this morning and they did an incredible job of telling people how to be allies <laughs> in the movement with the BIPOC community. And if you didn't get the guide, 
You need to get the guide out there because that's where it starts. Again, it starts with who? Exactly. <laughs> if you are part of an organization, you need to increase employee engagement and satisfaction. Inclusive environments where individuals feel valued and respected leads to higher levels of employee engagement and satisfaction. What company have you worked for where you're going to give your all and no one is satisfied or valued? Not me. That's the type of company that I'm going to leave if I'm not valued or satisfied or planning to leave, you know, or I'm just going to be a disgruntled employee. So if you want uh, an engaged, happy staff, you, you have to increase employee engagement and you have to satisfy them. Um, they're going to be motivated, productive, and committed. And that's what you want. You want the commitment to the work. Problem solving. You're going to solve problems better with diverse teams. They're better equipped to, to tackle complex problems, problems that you may not even have any idea that's taking place in the movement, in your corporation. So. Who wants to solve problems better in here? I know I do. It can, they can draw on a wider range of experiences and approaches leading to more effective problem solving and decision, decision making. This is the one I love, broader market reach. You want to tap into different markets? Guess what? <laughs> Your organization has to be diverse. Sorry, there's no other way you're going to be able to do it. If you want to be better positioned to understand and to cater to a diverse customer base, you're going to have to include diversity, be equitable, and um, you know, come, come from the standpoint and understanding that this is how you are going to grow. Uh, and that's how you attract and retain talent. You have to prioritize diversity and inclusion. Um, it's more, and it's more attractive to top talent. Individuals are more likely to join and stay with companies that value and promote diversity, creating a diverse and talented workforce. And I'm sure Nelva is going to dive into that more. Social responsibility and ethical imperative. Embracing diversity, equity, and inclusion is not only a business imperative, but also, also a social responsibility. It is essential to create fair and equitable opportunities for all individuals regardless of their background or identity. And when I sit back and I think about this, I'm 52. So diversity and equity and inclusion isn't just about race. It's also about age and age discrimination, sex discrimination. I'm a black woman. I'm, I'm you know, multi-racial. Uh, I'm 52. There's a lot of things that I need to worry about if I go back into corporate America? Am I going to make the money that I'm used to making because of the prejudices and things like that? I have a lot that I can offer. So these are things that I need to think about when I'm looking for employment in different organizations as well. So I'm concerned. Um, I don't know. I think I could stop there. <laughs> I mean, because I can go on and on. Um, here are some practical ways that you can promote it can promote diversity, equity, and inclusion in personal and professional settings. Establish employee resource groups. You gotta provide a platform where employees with shared backgrounds or interests can come together and foster a sense of belonging and advocate for inclusion in the workplace. Mentoring programs. You can facilitate personal and professional growth by connecting individuals with mentors who can provide guidance, support, and opportunities for development, uh, also participating in diversity-related events and activities by getting involved in organizing or volunteering for diversity-related events and activities within your organization. Step into the culture. Get out of your comfort zone and understand what different cultures are all about. This commitment of time can provide valuable opportunities for personal and professional development. And you want to promote cultural competence and continuous learning. So embrace cultural competence by actively seeking to understand and appreciate different cultures. Keyword, appreciate different cultures 
backgrounds, and perspectives. Engage in continuous learning to expand your knowledge and challenge biases. Biases. Encourage open communication. Yes. Encourage open communication and listening. Listen. Create an environment where all voices are heard and valued. Actively listening to others. Encourage open dialogue and foster a culture of respect and inclusion. Review and improve your hiring practices. So for corporations, ensure that you're setting up diverse panels of diverse panels of interviewers and training hiring managers on unconscious bias. Focus on selecting can candidates based on skills and experience rather than their personal characteristics. Set goals, collect data, and hold people accountable. Establish div diversity goals, collect data to track progress, and hold individuals accountable for improving diversity within the organization. It really just goes back to, it starts with you as an individual. Everyone in this room has, should have an invested interest in diversity, equity, and, and inclusion in their personal and professional life. I can give an example. Um, my daughter has been going to a school where it's, it's not as diverse, or it wasn't as diverse as we liked it when she was in kindergarten. So you're, you're thinking she's the only uh, Afro-Latina, the only vegan in the school. It is a vegetarian school, by the way. Um, and there were some incidences which made us uncomfortable, uh, unsafe space, but they have evolved to listening to us <laughs> And understanding that, um, you know, you want her in the school and you need to be inclusive. Now she's in an environment where it's safe. She's getting invited to birthday parties. They're having African Cultural Day or month and Latin America Day. You, it's up to you to make it a safe inclusive space. And if you're not doing anything about it, you can't come back to the community and say, why aren't we adopting this lifestyle? Or why aren't we doing this? Or why? It is your responsibility as well. Thank you. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about what Nitio does, and then I want audience participation. So um, I got started in the DEI space kind of by accident. I'm an Afro-Latina Afro as well. I'm originally from Panama. And when I was working at Grady, which is one of the largest public hospitals in Atlanta, um, they were like, uh, so you speak Spanish fluently, so you're over the interpreting services. <laughs> so I just kind of got, I was kind of co-opted into that, into that space. Didn't realize just how very little training a lot of our interpreters get. It, they just get pulled off, off, you know, off the carts. Sometimes they're, they're uh, housekeepers. Oh, you speak Spanish. Why don't you come interpret for, for us? And that's horrible, right? Because they don't know medical terminology, et cetera. So um, kind of got it into my, my company started because of that. You know, I wanted to make sure that interpreters were trained per the laws, by the way. The civil rights laws requires them to be trained. Um, so in the medical and in the legal space specifically, you want trained interpreters. Uh, so started my company doing that, and then eventually we started providing services. So we not only provide training for medical and legal interpreters and translators, but we now provide those services to hospitals or clinics that need uh, interpreters and translators trained, right? That's the, that's the operative word. Uh, but then really uh, started realizing that a lot of companies need training in how to engage with those diverse employees, right? So I thought, you know, perfect, perfect marriage, right? We're already training the interpreters. Now we're going to train the, the companies on how to interact with their diverse employees. There's a little bit of a problem, though. A lot of companies think that hiring DEI is all they have to do. You know, how many times do you, do you hear companies talk about, well, our, our numbers of certain amount of blacks or women, and they think, okay, we're a diverse company because we do that. Do you guys experience that? It's all, it's all about just the numbers, right? Well, that's a big problem, right? Because you can be invited to the party, 
but not invited to dance at the party. And that is what is happening to a lot of diverse employees. So they get invited to these companies and realize that the space, as Nigel was talking about, is not a safe space at all. Um, did anyone watch that movie on, um, on uh, how Uber got started? I loved it because it was like they wanted the, the certain amount of women in their company, but then once they got there, it was a very toxic male environment, right? And so we're experiencing a lot of that for a lot of tech companies. They, that's one of their main complaints, right? They, they want just the numbers, just to say, hey, we're a diverse company, but when they hire these employees, they're not engaging them, they're not promoting them from within, and they're not really inclusive at all. Uh, and inclusion, by the way, doesn't mean we have to all have the same ideas about how to do things. That's not inclusion. It's just simply being invited to the table so that your opinion is heard. That's, that's true inclusion. It's just saying, okay, you have a different idea, you have a different set of opinions, you have a different cultural background or, or life experiences, and we wanna hear about it, that's all. <laughs> Uh, and so what our company does when we engage with companies, uh, we call it our retain process. And retain stands for, R is for retention, E is for engagement, uh, T is for training, A is for assessment, I is for inclusion, and N is for networking. So I want audience participation in these, okay? <laughs> so if you guys are managers um, or owners of companies, can you raise your hands? Okay, we have, I would say, about a third of the, of the company, of, of uh, the attendees here. When you guys are hiring, when you're doing your hiring practices, right, are you looking to hire diverse employees? Is that the first thing that comes to mind? I want a diverse workforce? No, what are you looking for? Probably? So she says she's looking mostly for skills. Yeah, that's the number one thing. Okay, got it. Uh, anyone else wants to chime in? What are you looking for primarily when you're hiring your employees for your organization? But all, oh, there, there I am. Um, definitely skills, but we may get an overwhelming amount of people who are all have the skills, right? And so um, diversity of thought and also um, disability justice is important to me. So, uh, and I did ask this question. Um, and so I look for that as well, um, even in our youth program, how we center folks who have a visible or non-visible disability. Um, so that's how, you know, I look to further DIJ. I love that you an answer that question that way because so many times we have a very narrow view of what diversity is, right? As Nigel said, and, and as you just mentioned, diversity is so many different things. Uh, diversity is race, you know, cultural background, gender, age, di disability, you name it. All of those things are diversity. And so, um, and while it's super important to hire for skill. Obviously, we don't want unskilled people <laughs> working for us. Um, I think it's super important also to want different ideas. And I'm gonna sh share with you some statistics in a few minutes, but I didn't wanna just open up with stats. Um, but the statistics all say, if you want productive workforce, if you want to outpace your competition, you need diversity. You need diversity in your organizations. Um, and so for the first letter, the R, retention, you're not gonna be able to retain your diverse workers is if all you're doing is just hiring them for the numbers. That's not gonna happen. And you can easily tell once you join an organization if they're really about including you or not, if they're really about retaining you or not. If they just hired you for the numbers, you're gonna tell as a, as a person, as a human being, you're gonna know if you're wanted there or not. Um, and so one of the ways that you can tell if an organization is really serious about retaining people is how many people are they promoting? How many diverse employees are they promoting? To, you know, so oftentimes organizations will say, oh yeah, we have 20% uh, 
diverse employees, but then when you ask them, okay, so what positions are they? They're usually like entry level. <laughs> Do you really think that that organization really values diverse um, individuals if that's all they're good for, just the entry level positions? No. And so you can usually tell uh, right off the bat if a company is really serious about retaining diversity, uh, diverse employees, if by the amount of promotions that they have from with it. Okay, so the second one is uh, E, engagement. So as I mentioned, you know whether or not someone is engaging you, whether or not there's, you're being asked to sit at the table, right, inclusion. Um, one way to, to engage, okay, I'm gonna give you an example. So you guys all remember, some of you are old enough to remember this, back in the cell phone wars, <laughs> where all the cell phone companies wanted your business, so you had Verizon fighting over you, over you know Sprint and uh, what's the third one? Um, T-Mobile. Thank you. <laughs> so you had Verizon, Sprint, T-Mobile, AT&T as another one. So they would fight over your business, but then once they got you, you could never get anyone on the phone, right? It was like horrible customer service. I think they've gotten a little bit better, but it was like, why did you take me from Verizon? I was happy at Verizon, and now I'm over here, and you have horrible customer service, you can't get anyone on the phone. So it was, the engagement was lacking and that's how a lot of diverse employees feel when they're being pulled over or recruited from another company. They're recruited and then there's little love for me once I'm part of your organization and that's, that's what we as companies need to do a better job at is as, as far as engaging them. And how do you engage someone that's say from an Asian culture? How do you engage? Or how about, how do you engage a person with a disability, how do you engage them? Ask, <laughs> ask the question. Just ask them, how can, how can I serve you better? How can I be of service to you? And there's different ways to do that, obviously. You can do surveys, and that's the A, by the way, is assessment. It's really important to know how your employees feel about you. You can do surveys, you can do focus groups. There's lots of different ways to find out what your employees really want and how they, how they would best feel heard from you, okay? Um, what are some other engagement ideas that anyone has done in their organizations? How to, how to best engage with, with your employees? That's why they're here. Okay, so you want, so you want me to give you the answers, guys. <laughs> No, um, there's, lots of, there's lots of different ways. Um, I heard about an organization that does, um, for instance, um, like little uh, videos. They do like videos of the different employees and then they upload those and then everybody within the organization can kind of see from those videos how they feel about working there. So it's kind of, it's very, it's not necessarily anonymous, but it's very um, just personal to that organization. So it's different ways. It's, I mean, the possibilities are endless really about how to really engage, but it's, it's the desire to want to engage. I think that's the number one. Uh, so that's retention, that's engagement, then training. Uh, so so many organizations, this is another thing organizations do. They'll have a, a DEI training that comes from some third party organization and they present that to all their employees and they're, they're like, good, we're done. <laughs> we're, we're good, DEI, check. <laughs> Oftentimes, that training is so irrelevant to that kind of corporation. It has nothing to do with the actual concerns of the people that are working in that organization. Or, or, or it can be so general and high level that it doesn't really touch the actual issues, right? So think about the Uber again. I'm, I'm sorry if anyone works for, for Uber, but I'm picking on them right now. But think about the Uber again. So like if they just showed that one DEI training they probably would have been like, oh, we're good, but it was really just the women within the organization that didn't feel heard. And so would they have thought about, would they have um, met their needs just by showing that video? They weren't meeting their needs at all. And so it's really, the training really needs to be ground up from the ground level up. And so again, things like focus groups, things like surveys, things like, um, any, anything that's outside of the box that you can think of to really meet your, the, your employees. So one of the things that we do for our training, for instance, 
is we don't train you on what to look for for DEI. We train you on how to better engage with the different cultures. So we call it culture mapping. And that's important because even if you're a second or third generation from a different, from a region, that's why I asked the question about the different regions, um, there's different ways of looking at the world. If you're from, say, an Asian culture or Latin American culture or Western um, European culture, that, that is very unique to that area. And it's so important to understand that we really do have a different perspective in different unique ways of looking at the world <laughs> just from our cultures alone. And guess what? None of our cultures are wrong in, in looking at the world that way. And it's, that's the beauty of it. That's the beauty of, of being a human, really, um, that we have these different perspectives. It's just being able to have that conversation. Hey, I have this totally different way of looking at the world than you do. I'll give you an example. Um, we're probably familiar with this. Have you guys heard of black people time? Okay, black people, we, we are, we're, we're fully aware of this. Like if you go to someone's party that is predominantly, if it's gonna be a black, predominantly black party, <laughs> everyone's gonna be late, a lot of people are. <laughs> uh, that's why they call it black people time. Um, however, if you're super time con conscious, like I came from a culture that was super time conscious, it irritates me completely. If, uh, I'm, of, I'm of the belief that if you are um, on time, you're late. So being on time is like five to 10 minutes early, right? Um, and, that's, and that's a cultural thing. It's just understanding that. And it's not that they're being, they're being mean, it's starting an hour later <laughs> than they said they were gonna start. They're, that's just their culture. And it's just understanding those different little cultural differences. Uh, so culture mapping is really just understanding why. Why is it that time is really different for some cultures than others? Why is it that um, respect is different for some cultures? So in some cultures, it's really important. Like in my organization, I, I'm all about laissez-faire. It's everybody gets, a, gets to be heard. But in some cultures, it's super important that the authority figure is the authority figure. And why is that? And so it's, it, that's where culture mapping comes in, is understanding why cultures are different and why and, and where that came from and how we can engage even without, with those differences. And same with age. You know, uh, we've, we're hearing a lot of concerns about um, the baby boomer and how they're interacting with millennials. It's super frustrating for baby boomers <laughs> to interact with millennials and vice versa, right? Uh, but why is that? Why is that? Because we have a very different way of looking at the world, right? Our perspectives are totally different and that's okay. It's, and, and it's really important to just try to find common ground and find ways that you do not only share shared values, but how can I respect your value even if it's different from mine? Um, so that's all part of the training part, really and truly. We, we really just wanna train organizations and their employees on how to have different perspectives about people who have different perspectives <laughs> and, and how to respect different perspectives. I think that's the, that's the operative thing. Um, so after retention, engagement, training, then assessments. So we are super laser focused on assessments in our organization because we feel that if you don't measure it, you don't know if you improved or not. So a lot of organizations, as I mentioned, the only thing that they measure is whether or not they have a certain number of employees that meet the diversity metrics, right? But they don't measure, okay, if we have this particular group that doesn't feel heard, how can we measure if, we, if we've improved in that area? So that's where the assessment comes in. So you have to assess how people feel, your employees feel about your diversity measure, uh, efforts, and then you have to look at the numbers, and then you have to train and make, dis make concrete changes and concrete um, plans. We call them you know, SMART goals. We use the SMART goals to, to address those any areas of deficiency, and then you have to go back and assess, again, three to six months later, to see if your measures 
were effective or not, and if you, whether or not you have to go back to the drawing board. So I highly encourage anyone that's gonna start a DEI program, you don't have to hire a consultant, you can do it yourself, <laughs> but if you're gonna start a DEI program, start first with assessment. Make sure that you assess everybody 100% of your organization. Make sure it's, it's anonymous so that people feel comfortable sharing. But you look at those numbers, and then you, that's where you're going to attack the areas that are specific to your organization that needs to be changed, that needs to be addressed. And so a good assessment is going to talk about things like, do I feel like my company hears me? Do I feel like my company hires or promotes um, diversity? Do I feel that my company um, is, is listening or, or ha inc inviting me to, to my opinion, uh, inviting me to sit at the table? Those are the types of things, and it's very, very exhaustive, uh, this diversity assessment. And you, as I mentioned, you want to do it every three to six months to see if you're actually meeting your goals, okay? So that's the assessment, and then inclusion. So again, being invited to the party is not in the same as being invited to dance at the party. And that's the, the main thing. How are you including your diverse staff in your organization? So many organizations, and I'm, I'm sorry if I'm speaking really fast. <laughs> that's the Latina in me. So many organizations have silos. Have you guys noticed that? You guys experienced some of that? Yeah, where this group just deals with this group, that's it, and this group over here, and then you have this group over here. Um, I, I'm thinking more, uh, let's kind of take a little bit higher level in uh, the Congress right now. It's completely dysfunctional. Why? Because everyone's in their silos. Nobody's listening to anyone else. My group thinks this is how it needs to be, and we just, that's it, that's it. There's no compromise, because we're not really even interacting with anyone else. That's the end part, by the way, the networking part. There's no interaction with a group from a different area that thinks differently than us. There is no desire to know anything about that group. I'm gonna stay within my silo and I'm perfectly happy. Um, and that is, as managers, I'm gonna challenge you to break those up. <laughs> there's no silos, there's no silos allowed in your companies if you really want everyone to interact. And it's in that cross-pollination that productivity happens. It's in the cross-pollination that you are actually able to come up with brilliant ideas for your company and brilliant ideas for your customers. Um, if you're in silos, there's not, that's not gonna happen. That synergy, the challenge of working things out is where magic happens, okay? So break up those silos, make sure that you're including everyone. If you have silos based on rank, break those up. If you have silos based on de departments, break those up. Uh, so no silos. Or at least have areas where everybody has to interact and mingle. You know, not just the coffee, you know, not just at the coffee mug or at the water cooler. You know, have intentional areas within your company where everybody has to, you know, interact with each other and they're encouraged to and expected to listen to varied points of view, okay? Um, and the last one is networking, and that just kind of goes alongside with that inclusion. If you're making networking within your, within your company and within your organization a priority, it's not just gonna be, you know, let's go out to eat or let's go uh, to a bar. You're gonna make very intentional networking happen within your organization. So I like, obviously I like the idea of the Googles, uh, where they have like the, the ping pong tables and all of that, that's networking happening, right? Or if your company goes out to, I don't know, what are some ideas of networking that you guys can think of? Yes. Do you mind repeating that with the mic? Um, so I'm part of the Hive Slack community, and inside that community there is a channel that's called 
donut meetings, and every three weeks you are paired with another advocate within the community to schedule a 30-minute video call. And no matter the size of your organization, that could be a great way to pair up people to network. I love that. I love that. So that's intentional networking. <laughs> Anyone else has some ideas from their organizations or something, something that you would like to see your organization do? I actually have a question when it comes to just the other side of it where maybe employees don't want to be because everybody who is involved in this movement, there are a lot of people who are so focused on the work and getting the work done that they feel like, oh, I'm being distracted, I'm being pulled away from my work. So they can get a little bit, I guess, ornery and they are just like, why am I doing this? I could be better spending my time doing something else. How do you sort of deal with employees uh, having issues with that? Right. I would say that it's really important to realize, and I'm gonna share some, some stats. It's so important to realize that your work is best done like real work, like yes, you can get to, uh, there's, different, there's definitely a time to be very uh, focused, right, on, on the task at hand. Uh, but real change happens when we co collaborate. And so you have to see that as part of the work as well. So if you're thinking, oh, I just have these tasks that I have to get done, you know, maybe come in earlier in the day and get your tasks done. <laughs> But really, with the, 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 the magic of productivity and the magic of true change happens when we're collaborating with other human beings. And specifically, other human beings that have different points of views than us. Um, I'm gonna, I, I, he's not in here right now. I was talking to a gentleman that has a, a company. I don't know if I can, I can call him out. Um, but he was talking to me about how, you know, I'm just gonna use it. <laughs> Uh, we the we the free. So he started his company and he was so focused on what he's doing, right? Just calling attention to animal advocacy and wanting wanting that work to work, you know, to, to be advanced and his company to grow. But then he had an employee that was trans that changed from from um, from being uh, you know, con considered a male to be considered trans and he said he spent 100 hours <laughs> just getting that resolved. And, and then he, there were two trans, there was another trans employee that they were just going at it with what exactly it meant. And, and he was like, that had nothing to do with the work that we were doing. <laughs> but it took a lot of time and effort out of his day to, do, to, to really address that issue. And I would say be proactive with it. If you have a space where people feel like they can be heard in any area. Remember, we are all individuals coming to an organization. So it might be, you know, if you are all homogeneous in your race, but then one of you is much older and you have someone that has a disability or someone that's coming from a different part of the world. You know, we all are individuals and we all need to, to present ourselves as individuals in an organization. And so you, I, w I would say that the, the true work is giving space to that mm -hmm. within your company and then and letting that be a safe place for that to happen, for my individuality to, to be expressed. And if you really are like all about getting my tasks done, because I, I love checking off things off the box. I'm, I'm very type A in that, in that regard. Uh, but I know that for me, if I want to check off everything off my list, I have to start my work a little bit earlier, just so I can do, get that done. Uh, specifically like emails and stuff like that, I'll get that done before, usually I, before I'm even out of the bed, <laughs> get my emails taken care of. Um, so I would just encourage you to maybe change your, change your schedule, your, your own personal schedule a little bit, if you feel that that's gonna interfere with getting your task accomplished. Okay. And Nelva, Nelva, while we're at the questions, there was one that uh, came in earlier that um, if we can just address that and then we can go through the stats. Um, so thank you for, for that because this one question was asked about um, with so many trends towards DEI programming being deprioritized in affirmative action lawsuits, how can we ensure that organizations in the animal protection space continue to remain steadfast in DEI work and that these trends don't take hold here? 
Um, I'm just going to give like some, you know, just top responses to that, just summarize that you have to recognize the importance of DEI. So remember that D diversity, equity, inclusion does start with you. Um, the leadership commitment, so that inclusive leadership that we talked about earlier, integrating DEI into the business strategy, being accountable for DEI, addressing any implicit bias, shifting from diversity training to leadership development coaching, um, engaging employees and consumers, and staying informed and adapt. So I just wanted to make sure we answered that question. And, and she was saying trends. I think it sounded different. But I've seen that specifically within the federal government, for instance, that they are really shutting down a lot of DEI programs. And it's because I've per my personal belief is that it's being co-opted, DEI. When you think about DEI now, you're not thinking about all the things that we talked about that spans diversity. It's just one group that's co-opting DEI. <laughs> and I think that's why com uh, companies are, are shutting down. Um, that's my feeling. That That's why so many companies are shutting down, which is throwing the baby out with the bathwater. You know, we, we need more diversity within our companies to be, to truly, you know, um, include everyone and be the, the companies that we know that we can be. I'm gonna just throw a little bit of statistics out to you as to why DEI is so important. Um, and you guys probably know this, but I'm gonna just give you numbers. Diverse companies enjoy two to three times higher cash flow per employee than your non-diverse companies. Diverse management has been shown to increase revenue by 19%. So if you have diverse managers, so if you're worried about if, you know, promoting your uh, diverse employees to managers, if that's going to affect you, yes, it will affect you in a positive way. 19% growth of revenue. Three in four job seekers actually want to be in a diverse environment. They don't want homogeneous environments. Because I, I think we intrinsically recognize that diversity is good for us, good for our thought. Right? Um, here's, an, here's another stat. Uh, the predicted quit rate for white uh, counterparts is 3.73%. But then, if you look for African Americans, that's 4.79%. So when you think about turnover, and turnover is expensive. So anyone that's a manager or a company owner knows if I have to hire and train someone and then that person leaves three months, that is very expensive to keep doing that over and over again. So if you want to retain your employees, think about that. So 4.79% of African Americans will leave because of lack of engagement and inclusion. And that number goes up to 5.42% for African American women. Mm -hmm. So those are just a few of the stats that will let you know that's super important to hire keep and promote from within. Two, two questions I want to make sure we get in in the sake of time. Um, can you expand more on the role of DEI in disability justice? What tips do you have for organizations who want to center disability justice in DEIJ? Yeah. <laughs> well, I think the young lady um, brought that up earlier about diver um, disabilities being part of DEI. Um, I think, I. Personally, I love the, the, um, the movement from, from that uh, area, uh, from, from, the, from those folks, because they are so passionate, right? And if you're, so, if you're passionate, just like they talked about earlier in, in advocacy, you're going to find your, your legislators that are going to promote you. You're going to, to uh, form your groups, and you're going to write your letters and all of those things. Um, I think it's important that organizations have a space for that and, and make sure that they are in fact including and listening and actually act, acting on the recommendations of their employees. And one, one last question, because again, we got uh, 30 some odd seconds. How can we bridge perspectives on DEI progress between white and BIPOC individuals 
Um, someone shared uh, in the Hoover articles a resource called Continuum on Becoming a Transformative Anti-Oppression or Organization. And often it seems white individuals perceive more progress than what BIPOC would say. This is a rough one. I, I haven't read the article, so I'm not. Um, I, I like to hear from the audience. Yeah. Does, does anyone have an answer to that one? I think, um, let's, let's circle back with that and see if we can get an answer and, and post it in there. So I'll take that back and see what type of research I can gather, okay, if that's okay. But those were all the questions for this session. Um, we appreciate you joining us. If you have any questions um, individually for either myself or Nelva, uh, please reach out. And again, I'll see what I can get about that last question, okay?